All right, well, uh, we'll get into it. This is the final um, final session for the symposium. Uh, the lightning talks and the presentations in this session all sort of center around the topic of migrating your institutional repository. Uh, just as we've done before, we'll gather up the uh, the questions for a, a Q and A at the end. So if you have any questions during any of the presentations, feel free to toss them into the chat, and we'll get to them at the end, time permitting. So let's get started. Our first presentation in this session is a tale of two migrations: a medical library case report. And our presenters for this uh, uh, lightning talk will be Lisa Palmer. Tess Krynak and uh, Sally Gore from UMass Chan Medical School. Take it away when you're ready. Okay, here we go. Just gonna move things around a little bit. There we go. Okay, can you hear me and see the slides? All good, yep. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Lisa Palmer. We uh, recently completed, completed two migrations at UMass Chan Medical School. Uh, these migrations were from BPress Digital Commons, uh, that platform to Open Repository, a DSpace solution from Atmire, and Janeway, a publishing platform. Tess Granick and Sally Gore are the other members of our library migration team and helped prepare this presentation. UMass Chan was an early adopter of Digital Commons. We launched our e-scholarship repository in 2006. Uh, we're their second medical school customer. In 2016, we implemented the BPress Archive Service, which works with Amazon Simple Storage Service to provide an archive of IR content and metadata. In August 2017, BPress was acquired by Elsevier. This raised several questions for us, most notably future uh, affordability and our ability to, ma to maintain our commitment to uh, open access. So that December, our library management approved a task force to assess needs and make recommendations. Uh, two key factors were driving our work. Uh, we wanted to support sustainable community-led open source infrastructure and our library does not have the capacity to manage the locally hosted repositories so we focused on hosted turnkey solutions that do not require substantial library staff resources for development or system administration um, so e-scholarship at UMass Chan utilized Digital Commons repository and publishing features based on this we developed campus-specific functional requirements, performed an environmental scan to identify options, evaluated numerous platforms, narrowed our choices, and met with providers. After several years and a global pandemic, in June 2021, the library initiated the procurement process for Open Repository and for Janeway. Legal approvals and organizational changes, including our medical school changing its name in September 2021, proved to be substantial hurdles. Um, we finally signed a contract with Open Repository in November 2021 and Janeway in February 2022. After uh, an onboarding period, migration activities began in er earnest in February with a library implementation team of four people. Four peer-reviewed uh, journals and one textbook were migrated to Janeway and everything else to open repository. We utilized various metadata sources as shown on the slide. From March through September, uh, the library team and representatives from UMass Chan Information Technology met weekly with each provider. Um, given our remote working structure and the fact that both providers are located in Europe, this wasn't uh, easy, but we successfully met our September deadline when our digital common subscription ended. So our migration had several challenges that caused delays in addition to um, pandemic related, you know, work disruptions and staff shortages. Um, finding a meeting time and timely correspondence were challenging definitely across um, multiple time zones. Uh, 
The repository had not used single sign-on technology before, previously to authenticate and log in securely. So we, we implemented it with Shibboleth for Open Repository and OIDC for Janeway. And UMass Chan IT um, figured out how to test both systems in a secure way. Um, to ensure that the Digital Commons URLs redirected accurately to both new platforms, a chain of redirects needed to be set up and the domain name system implementation had to be timed very carefully. We also experienced um, issues with migrating digital commons data, um, some of which are listed on the slide. Um, <clears throat> for example, we were unable to programmatically export granular usage data with geographic information, such as download co counts for every item for every month broken down by country of origin. So we decided to migrate user statistics without the geographic data. Um, in the interest of time, you know, I'm not going to um, talk about the rest of these uh, options here listed on the slide, but I'm happy to, you know, talk about it in the Q&A Q or offline. Um, this was our experience. Your mileage may vary and things may be different for future migrations. Uh, B-Press was really helpful in answering my questions and assisting when possible. We learned many lessons from this experience, but I'll focus on a few. Um, doing two migrations at once was difficult. No kidding, right? Um, our plan was to do the Janeway migration first, but factors described earlier made that impossible. So as a result, resources were stretched. The URL redirects were a lot more complicated and everything was more stressful. Um, in terms of your migration schedule, build in much more time than you think you'll ever need. Um, prepare by cleaning up your records as needed. Make your submission forms and your use of metadata fields as consistent as possible because standardization really pays off when you're mapping metadata to the new system. Document your custom fields. Um, and finally, bring I, uh, local IT in early on if needed. Our weekly meetings were critical and helped with communication and uh, relationship building. So our repository will actually migrate to the DSpace 7 version of Open Repository in 2023. So there's no rest for the weary, um, but we've learned a lot and look forward to a smooth uh, migration. So thank you. I look forward to any questions later. Great, thank you, Lisa. All right, uh, our next presentation is uh, Tease in the Maze, Navigating Administrative Processes for digital collection migration. Our presenters will be Pamela Pierce and Tracy Thornton from Oregon Health and Science University. Thank you. And I listed uh, Tracy Thornton as kind of a gateway into my presentation topic uh, because she is not actually here with me, but she is our director of library operations. And without her, uh, this presentation and our work would not happen. Uh, because, and I, so my goal is to surface administrative work uh, with my talk uh, because it's truly essential. And I feel it's interesting to be talking about like the actual migrating work into a platform because I feel like there should be one uh, group of lightning talks like pre-migration, like, so you've chosen a platform, now what? Uh, because that's where we've been uh, for the last year, actually. Um, and at Oregon Health and Science University, uh, we're Oregon's only academic health center, and uh, we care for patients. Uh, we have a school of medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, uh, public health, um, lots of nurses as well. The, the School of Nursing is very active, um, and we conduct extensive research. Uh, we have about Almost 20,000 employees, uh, four, almost 5,000 students, um, and it's a complex place to negotiate. Uh, we selected TIND um, almost, we're coming up on our one year anniversary, and this is actually a great week to be giving this presentation because one year later, uh, we finally have a, we're like the signed contract, like we got it back from the contracts office, the signed version, and then sent it to the vendor and all they have to do is sign. Like it's finally a done deal. Um, and that's 
uh, after like a tight budget climate and negotiating various systems. Uh, so it's really great to be giving this talk this week because I actually have a happy ending. And we still need to move all of our things out of San Vera so I can come back and give another talk about how that goes. Um, but our digital collections <laughs> include his historical collections and archives materials, ETDs, and lots of marketing images. And as I said, the admin help, especially at a university or OHSU, um, is a really huge deal. Uh, because to kind of give some highlights of the last year, uh, we had to do the security review process, which included something called Process Bolt uh, that we weren't even aware of. Uh, we had to think about giving the vendor access to our system to see if they could get the items out of San Vera or if we needed to hire someone else to do that. And then to get the vendor access to our system, we needed to do like a short contract. And then to do the short contract, we needed them to estimate how much money that would take. And then we needed to get them the access and have the proper privileges to do that. And, and you know, then a year passes. Uh, so the things that are relevant to other institutions um, which I think everyone would say this, but everything will take longer than you think. And to really make sure that you connect with your admin team or the people that can help you negotiate these systems at whatever university you're at. Hopefully other places, I mean, I, I hope there are places simpler than OHSU, but I'm not sure that there are. Um, so, and really make sure that the admin work is visible and appreciated. And as always, to plan ahead and start early. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. And uh, we'll move along to the next presentation, uh, Making Cancer History Online, uh, the Open Works at MD Anderson Legacy page. Uh, Jose Javier Garza is gonna be presenting from MD Anderson at Cancer Center. Hello, can you see my presentation on my screen? I see your presentation and I hear you. Great, I will, all right, well, hello. Uh, my name is Jose Javier Garza and I am a senior librarian and archivist at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center's Research Medical Library Historical Resources Center. Um, the word center appears in my title twice. Um, this afternoon, I'm gonna give a presentation about the Making Cancer History Voices Oral History Collection, how we process the interviews initially, and how we had to reprocess our interviews following the library switch to a new institutional repository. So in my presentation, I'll give a brief overview of the oral history collection, the unique characteristics of the project that make it a challenge to process, and then detail what our originally processing plan entailed, and then how we had to update it when we moved to a B-Press repository. And then I'll include with a few pros and cons and some lessons learned during the project. So just to begin, the HRC is the official archival repository of the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, from its 80 year history, it grew from a, um, from a small building in a carriage house in the downtown Houston to one of the finest oncology institutions in the world. Um, so our mission is to help to preserve that history. Um, we do that by collecting and making available all types of resources from institutional records, um, books about cancer care and um, our oral history collection. So for the focus I will be talking about, we'll be making the oral history collection available to researchers. Well, since the archives is founded in the early 2000s, the oral history interviews have been an integral part of our collection. Initially, interviews were recorded for to help publish a book about the um, history of the institution, but we've also grew that collection for more reasons, for, for better reasons, to by, like tell the story of the institution. Um, I like to include this quote from um, my former director, Dr. Stephen Tomasovic. Um, the gist of it is, we collect oral histories because it gives the human side behind the research. So behind the CVs, behind the um, publications, behind the textbooks, behind the lectures, there's a person behind that story. And so we feel that the oral history collection puts that human side of that and how they came to it. So each interview subject sat a down. So we have about, about, about 140 interviews, um, which is a lot for our collection. Um, so each interview subject sat down for about up to eight interview sessions with an average about being two to three. 
Individual interview sessions range from one to two hours. So in, the, in addition to conducting the interviews, a unique aspect of our collection is the amount of metadata we generate. Um, usually when oral histories are made available, there's some description, there's some subject headings about the entire interview, but in order to maximize our content, we decided to divide each interview into chapters and each chapter gets its, gets its own metadata. So it makes it easier for people to find targeted portions of the interview without having to listen to the entire interview or read or keyword search the transcripts. Um, so our interviews are broken up into chapters. Each is given a unique title, a brief abstract is written about the chapter, and then each chapter is indexed with a unique control vocabulary that provides additional descriptors for the collection. So there has been considerable debate in the oral history community about what constitutes the oral history interview, whether it's the audio file or the transcript. From the very beginning, we've strived to provide both access to the audio material and the transcript because there are some there are some strengths to both of them. So, for example, we like to provide the audio file because it does provide the orality of the interview. So some things that can't be captured just within the text. So. Our goals for interview processing include both being able to search and discover both entire interviews, but then also the individual individual chapters, providing access to the interview information and the metadata, co-locating similar topics using the metadata schema, and then accessing both the interview and the transcript files. In order to achieve all the outline goals, we created a processing plan that required three distinct products or platforms. We first used the, o the Oral History Metadata Synchronizer, or OMS, to host all of our interviews. It provided access to both versions of the interview, audio and transcript, while also the ability to navigate directly towards the individual chapters. Um, we use the library's LibGuides page to provide finding aids for all the interviews, so that would include all the descriptive metadata and provide links to the OMS interviews. And then we used OCLC's Content DM to be the searchable database for the interview collection. So we included the ability to search by author or by subject heading, but you can also click for particular topics. Um, so that's so for this one, we were only a, we were upload a, we were able to upload all the metadata, but we didn't actually use the um, we didn't upload any of the audio files because there were space limitations with our license, which will be important in a minute. So this is kind of a screenshot of the different repositories. So on the far left is OMS. As you can see, it has both the part of the audio file and it, it has the audio file, but also some of the um, information. There is a way to click through the transcript. Um, you can also time code the transcript to have to go to specific portions of the interview by word. Um, in the middle is the LibGuides page, which has some of the finding aid information. So all of the upper level information about the interview subject and about the interview as a whole. And then on the far right is what we had in Content DM. So you can see a little bit about the information that you can click through. So that's an example of the coding system and how it looked. So you know each of those each of those blue thing each of those blue things are like clickable. So you can go to you know topics. So for example, if I wanted to know more about mentoring at MD Anderson, I could click on the mentoring code and get to all the individual to more stories about that. So a brief aside about OMS, which we unfortunately had to say goodbye to, um, it was actually a really useful tool for oral history interviews, mostly because it provided both the audio, the metadata, and the transcript on one page. So it was very important for us to be able to provide that functionality. So we had to, so it was a great tool that we had. Unfortunately, we couldn't keep it. Um, so even though we did have an admittedly convoluted processing plan, things were moking out for the most part. But as things happened, things in the library changed. First, our information systems librarian retired, and he was the one who maintained the server that all the OMS files were hosted on. Um, the institution was also cracking down on security, so um, getting another server or someone else to maintain their server was going to be a challenge. Um, also, the Research Medical Library licensed Digital Commons as the new institutional repository, and since we couldn't have redundant repositories, we decided that the entire project had to be migrated to a new system. So. One of the first things I did when we were switching is I exported all of the metadata from Content DM, which included all the descriptors, all the transcripts, all the information, in order to repurpose it into our new digital repository, which we called OpenWorks at MD Anderson, which is on B Press. Um, so 
it was a, so part of this was a challenge because we basically had to rethink how interviews were processed and made available. We had to learn the new vocabulary in digital commons. So collections became communities, you know, other collect like series became galleries and so on and so forth. So we had to like learn kind of how to process that those informations with that. Um, we also had to learn about metadata crosswalks to see which metadata fields would correspond to the other ones. So we had to rethink how this entire process was, was how this process was done. Um, one of the things that was important in in OpenWorks is we wanted to maintain the interview structure. So we wanted to be able to provide access both to interview sessions, which tend to be longer, have, you know, one to two hours, but then also the individual chapters. So we created two different galleries, one for whole interviews and then one for individual chapters that you can link to with hyperlinks in between them. So this is an example of a completed interview. So on the left, it has Dr. Ahern's interview. It has, you know, access to download the transcripts. And then on the bottom of it, you'll see the hyperlinks, which take you to the interview individual chapters. So that has a brief description. It has the identifier, the transcript, and the audio file there. It also has the topics covered, which are some of the subject headings that we use to describe all of the interviews. So. What we did was repurpose the metadata from Content DM. This is an example of the spreadsheet that I exported before we sunsetted the project. And then I converted it to Excel to do some um, data normalization, some processing. So overall, that spreadsheet has over 1,500 lines of code to go through, which is a lot. <laughs> um, one of the things we had to do was crosswalk the metadata, which was a challenge because we had to rethink how certain metadata fields looked. Um, in Content DM, we could create metadata fields on the fly. We can also set which Dublin Core standard they align to, and then we can also set subject headings or keyword fields against a controlled vocabulary. So something like the Library of Congress subject headings, or more importantly for us, medical subject headings or MeSH. Um, the two asterisk fields are the two asterisks are examples where there wasn't where we couldn't just do a cut and paste. Um, if you've worked in B Press, you know, for example, the author field is broken up into subfields like first name, middle name, email address, which wasn't in Content DM. So we had to reprocess those fields. Also, the dates in the dates in B Press aren't a DAC standard, so it's slightly different for how we were putting them in Content DM. So the date fields also had to be reformatted. And if anyone um, has any frustrations working with date fields in Excel, I um, I sympathize with you. <laughs> so. This is an example of our entire migration sequence. We made the decision not to do a direct ingest into OpenWorks from Content DM because both of the structure, the metadata, and also we weren't we there were actually no audio files in um, Content DM to move into BPress. So we decided to redo the entire processing using the metadata as a basis for it. Um, we do, we're doing this one by one, so we are taking it on a case by case level, which makes it a little bit more time consuming, but hopefully it'll be well worth the effort. So the first step is um, reprocessing the audio files. Since we lost ohms, we could not um, there was no place to host the audio files, so I had to go in and I have to go in using Adobe Audition to get um, go to all of the larger audio files and then break them up into smaller MP3s and then batch upload those into BPress. Um, BPress makes it fairly easy to batch upload files, so for each gallery has a downloadable spreadsheet that we can cut and paste the original metadata from the Content DM spreadsheets. Some of the metadata, like the author and dates, can't be, cus can't be cut and pasted in directly, so those needed to be reformatted um, or redone. The next step is to send the spreadsheet up, upload the spreadsheet with BPress and include links to the audio files that we uploaded separately. Um, once everything was processed, we did some quality control, which means checking each interview sessions and chapters were linked. Um, one of the one of the um, so one of the things they recently added to BPress was the ability to batch upload files. So instead of having to upload each chapter and each segment individually or each audio file, we were able to upload you know ten to twenty audio files at once, generate the links, and feed those into the spreadsheet. So. 
some of the pros of the system, um, it's library supported, which means that other folks within the library can participate in the project. At first, I was the only one working with digital assets. So I was, you know, I was the only one working in OCLC. So there's other folks that can help me out with it. Um, also, we are Digital Commons is designed to be an open access education tool. So it's in within the same ecosystem as other digital materials. So for example, a professor, you know, who uploads a lecture of his also has his oral history interview. So it kind of fulfills Dr. Thomas, Dr. Thomas Ovik's goal of having both the um, academic, you know, the professional materials, but then also the personal side. Um, we cut down our systems from three into one, so there's less shortcuts, which means there's less room for error, um, so it makes it easier to, um, you know, like not make simple mistakes. Um, there's downloadable content, so like I mentioned, we never actually uploaded any of the audio files to OCLC, but in BPress, we can upload, we've uploaded the audio files to download and PDFs of the transcripts. Um, also, BPress makes it really easy to look at metrics, um, so as you've seen various examples of the dashboards, um, we can get much more metrics, metrics are a lot more easier to maintain. Um, there are some drawbacks to the migration. So like I said, we couldn't do a direct migration, um, mostly because of the metadata and audio files. Um, timing is a challenge because this collection was about 80% pro processed the first time around. Now we have to re almost start from scratch using some of the materials. A lot of the interviews are now unavailable when they previously were, so we will get emails or calls about interviews that were once available, so now we have to deliver them asynchronously. Um, we had to reprocess the audio files, which is time consuming, um, and then we have to do some extra steps for batch uploading, like uploading the audio files and the metadata almost separately, and then um, one of the issues is the subject headings in BPress. Um, working with the keywords, you know, it's not linked to get, it's not, it can't be run against a controlled vocabulary. So there's no way to authenticate any, if the keywords are the same or not. So if the syntax is wrong in one, in one interview, then it won't be, you know, there might be some errors in that. And then also while we can upload, a, we do have some video interviews, Currently, if we upload them, they are downsized for streaming. So there is, so we don't, we don't have any HD videos uh, online yet. So um, some of the lessons learned is always have a backup plan because you never know when your library is going to take away your institutional repository. That includes the ability to export all the uploaded files and metadata. Um, keep all of the planning doc and working documents because you never know when you're going to need them. An example is when I was reprocessing the audio files, um, I needed to get the time codes for where all the chapter points are. Well, in the OMS XML spreadsheets actually had the time codes, so I was able to kind of cut and paste those into Excel. Um, if I was better at style sheets or XML, I could design, you know, across, like I can design a style sheet that would create a file for me to upload, but I'm just not, that, I'm not that great at it. Um, normalize the metadata fields as much as possible. So make sure that all the fields have the same format, all the same syntax. So, you know, make, make sure you do that on like the data end of it before you do the uploads to fix it. And then also, this is more of like a philosophical one for me, is find a balance between the, the your access requirements and the workload that you can do. Um, we admittedly have a very, Con, we have a very convoluted or a lot, a lot of steps involved to making these interviews available, but that's because we set out our goals to have this amount of accessibility or this amount of discoverability. So it, we put a lot of work into it because that's what we want. So my advice is to, you know, figure out what's the best steps for your pro, for your um, for your program. Um, so that's about it. I'd like to give a shout out to the folks at B Press, especially Courtney Barkley and Shandon Quinn for all of my emails and requests and wacky questions I might have. And is there's my contact info for compliments, criticisms, questions, and compliments. So thank you. Great, thank you. That was, that was really good, uh, really interesting work. Um, difficult migration. <laughs> Um, okay, next uh, next up, we have uh, Moving Metadata and Medicine, Migrating a Nursing History photo uh, Photograph Collection to Digital Commons. Um, uh, Maureen Check from uh, Misericordia University, who will be presenting. 
Hey, is everyone able to see my PowerPoint all right? Yes, I see okay. it and I hear you. Great, and see me? Okay, great. Okay, uh, good afternoon all and thank you so much for being here. Um, today I'm going to be sharing some of my experiences with migrating a digital collection of nursing history photographs. What I did, what I think I did reasonably well, and what I will be doing going forward. The Center for Nursing History of Northeastern Pennsylvania at Misericordia University documents the history of nursing and the many nursing schools in the Keystone State's Wyoming Valley. In 2015, the center received a grant to digitize and host its photograph collection. This presentation will share some of the challenges, successes, and lessons learned during the migration of over 500 digital objects from art store public collections, then shared shelf commons, to the library's institutional repository on digital commons. In her early history of nursing in Pennsylvania, Roberta Mayhew West identifies the charismatic Mrs. Eunice Sprague as an early practitioner of obstetrics in Luzerne, Lackawanna, and Wyoming counties, and for a time, the only midwife in Wilkesbury in the late 1700s up until about 1810. Wilkesbury City Hospital, now known as Wilkesbury General Hospital, was founded in 1872 after the community took up the petition for a hospital after several significant mining disasters. The Religious Sisters of Mercy were first established in Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh, and a chapter was founded in Wilkesbury in 1875. The sisters built hospitals in Wilkesbury in 1897 and in Scranton in 1917. Hospitals tackled specific ailments like consumption and the influenza pandemic. Nursing history in the Wyoming Valley includes military history as well. During World War II, nearly all of the nursing schools supported cadet, corps nursing, cadet nursing corps programs. Two of the women who later became known, known as Angels of Bataan during the Japanese occupation of the Philippines during World War II were from the Wyoming Valley. Local women served in Vietnam and assisted the government with writing nursing programs for South Vietnamese schools, as well as having served in the first Gulf War. As nursing schools and hospitals in the region merged and closed over the course of the 20th century, interested faculty and alumni took it upon themselves to save photographs and other materials documenting school activities and student experiences. The center was founded to address the need to preserve this rich and quickly disappearing local history. Since the first nursing school opened in, at the Wilkesbury City Hospital in 1887, thousands of nurses have been educated and trained in the Wyoming Valley. Many cared for the sick and injured locally, while others moved across the United States and around the world. The mission of the center stems from a st strong desire to preserve and share the stories of local nurses by giving these mostly women a voice in a largely marginalized area in the history of medicine. The Center for Nursing History was established at Misericordia University in 2005 with funding from the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. Its mission is to acquire, collect, preserve, and provide access to a wide range of materials documenting the history of nursing and the many nursing schools in the region. In 2015, the center received a grant from the Council for Independent Colleges and the Mellon Foundation that provided funding to host our first, and at that point only, true digital collection on what we now know as Art Store Public Collections, then known as Shared Shelf Commons. Previously, some of the collection's digital objects had been posted to Flickr, which of course was a standard cost-effective option at the time. The use of Flickr for the center had been primarily geared toward outreach and access. The CIC grant presented a new opportunity to create and implement a digital preservation plan. Thanks to this grant, over the course of 2015-2016, about a thousand items were digitized and described. Further refinement to the collection occurred between 2017 and 2018, including employing standardized vocabularies like LCSH, name authority files, and AAT for form and genre terms. I even brought in the big guns, retired nurses from one of the represented schools, to help me with my lack of medical knowledge and to identify people, places, and equipment. The collection was reduced by almost half and highlighted unique images, portraits of nursing students, graduate nurses, dormitory life, capping, pinning, and graduation ceremonies, and students learning on a variety of medical equipment. There are certainly more photos to add, but could now be done so much more intentionally. There were multiple benefits of the collection being hosted on Art Store Public Collections, including the ability to reach new audiences on a reliable open access platform with name recognition, and the ability to crosswalk collection items and metadata into compatible platforms like Omeka. 
Misericordia adopted BPRESS Digital Commons in early 2018 as its institutional repository as a requirement for a program's accreditation. It was not sensible to maintain two digital repositories for a campus not yet fully invested in digital pedagogy, primary source research, research, or open access, especially when one of those platforms was already a requirement for an academic accreditation and could in fact be utilized to host archival materials. Digital Commons is a hosted software product that accommodates a wide variety of formats, offers customizable structures and metadata options, features flexible publishing options, and robust analytical tools. Digital Commons is in use at other comparable liberal arts institutions where archives and special collections have taken advantage of the platform's capabilities to host multiple types of files for collection material, as well as finding aids. In discussion with our library's director, I envision utilizing Digital Commons in the same way for the Center for Nursing History Photographs and later Oral Histories. Fortunately, the collection metadata had already been through the ringer more than once since I inherited this collection and project in 2016. Plans for migration began in about 2019, after I got my bearings in Digital Commons and pulled the metadata from Shared Shelf. And then we all know what happened in 2020. I'll address that when I get to my challenges. Over 2021 and into summer 2022, I had a student and a staff member embed metadata into digital objects, read derivatives, and ensure consistent file naming. The student was trained on the back end of Digital Commons and uploaded all 500 digital objects, bless him, in one summer. COVID, of course, proved to be the most significant challenge to a reasonable project timeline. In terms of staffing, being able to work on it remotely and change priorities once we returned to campus and had to navigate our new world. The collection has been down much longer than I had, had anticipated or hoped it would be. There are also a few platform specific challenges I've had to grapple with. The most significant being that unlike ArtStore, Digital Commons is not built specifically for images or archival collections. It is a publishing platform geared mostly towards secondary works in data and hosting journals, complete with peer review functionality. While it can accommodate a wide variety of file types, embed audio and video players, embed audio and video players, and display any number of fields, the required fields are not as flexible as we tend to need them to be. I gathered examples of other Digital Commons collections and worked with Digital Commons' excellent customer service team to work around the platform's limitations. The required fields turned out to be, much, to be the least flexible from primary sources, which I of course discovered as I worked, even despite my planning and crosswalking. The required fields are browsable within the repository, so it was important to make them work, not only for these collections themselves, but alongside everything else in the IR. Added fields are only keyword searchable. Digital Commons requires a date field, which usually means the date of publication, with no option for undated, circa dates, or a date range, such uncertainty is difficult in archival collections. Such certainty is difficult in archival collections. We worked out two date fields, one uh, for date of upload into the IR, which is the standard required date field, and one for date of origin of the item itself, which is an open text field that allows for flexibility. Like any archival collection, Digital Commons requires an author. However, the author field in a DC record is much more modern, needing a first and last name or identification as a corporate author. There is no flexibility for LCNAF, and because Digital Commons lets you browse by author, it isn't helpful to mix archival collection creators with professors or students as authors of their own scholarly works. The solution here was to use the required author field for the archival collection with Misericordia University as the corporate author, almost like a publisher, and then an open text field again for an additional creator field for the archival objects creator. Digital Commons employs disciplines uh, rather as another access point for browsing. Unlike LCSH or form and genre terms, they can't reflect thingness, only aboutness. So another open field for form and genre needed to be created separately and added. And finally, since I had already applied LCSH to each photograph, I decided to modify those terms into keywords. There aren't standard guidelines for image specs in Digital Commons and the image viewer tool I found to be more or less helpful depending on upload size. Digital Commons has a lot of advantages, despite its limitations. Uh, like ArtStore, it is crawled by Google and other popular search engines, which is one of the most common ways uh, users get to our repository. 
Our Digital Commons customer service team is outstanding. They help me conceptualize plans, provide me with examples at other institutions who use the platform, and troubleshoot problems very quickly and patiently. Analytical data on the back end provides a lot of insight into how users get to our collections, from where, what is downloaded, viewed, or played, and social media shares. I have some data to date uh, usage for one collection, the Gertrude Argus Watercolors and Photographs. You can see a readership distribution map here and a number of downloads and views per specific work. Like public collections, Digital Commons has its own shared network across which users can search. Our repository is searchable on Pennsylvania Research Commons alongside other large and small colleges and universities in the state that use Digital Commons. My lessons learned include having your metadata in tip-top shape. It took me a long time to be happy with the quality of the description, and I still ran into challenges with the platform, simply because it was not designed for primary sources. But because my description was what I wanted, I could more easily focus on problem-solving fields and troubleshoot the needed workarounds. And those I did really not know until I needed that I needed until we began uploading. Another lesson is that no one can do it alone. There has been a this has been a long-term collaboration effort with a lot of different players over the years. I've had help throughout this entire process with description, uploading, and quality control from students and interns, staff and colleagues, retired nurses, and both Art Store and Digital Commons teams. Some next steps I'd like to take once everything is uploaded is to go back to promoting the collection. After it has been down for so long and have an opportunity to bring it to new audiences, both on campus and more broadly. Promoting the IR generally is a more concerted effort I've undertaken in the past few years, and the addition of primary sources to it will make it all the more robust. Before I close, I'd like to take a moment to dedicate this presentation to Donna Ayers Nelson, who founded the center in 2005 and who passed away late last year. This is the first presentation I've given since Donna's passing, and literally none of it would be possible without her. Donna was incredibly passionate about nursing history, and I'm honored to have worked with her as long as I did. Now, in closing, migrating a digital collection is a challenge, even when you think you have at least some stars aligned. The journey of this digitization project of nursing history photographs has had its stops and starts, but access to this significant collection remains important as the more physical monuments to this region's medical history continue to become distant memories. Hosting the photographs on Misericordia Digital Commons supports the mission Donna Nelson established the Center for, giving voice to nurses by documenting their educational and professional experiences and sharing those experiences with the next generation. Thank you. Oh, Maureen, that was a great presentation. Uh, thank you. Um, many years ago, I was the uh, nurse's historical archivist at Johns Hopkins, and uh, hearing you talk about working with the, the retired nurses is, hits me right in the field, you know. <laughs> they, they're wonderful. Uh, yeah, good work. Um, all right, we'll move on to the, to the next presentation. Uh, this is the final presentation. Uh, this is uh, CU Anschutz uh, Digital Collections Migration from DSpace to Haiku. Uh, Raven Morgan is going to be uh, doing this presentation from uh, Strauss Health Sciences Library at the University of Colorado Anschutz uh, Medical Campus. Take it away, Raven. Okay, so I'm going to try and share my slides. Okay, can everyone see them and hear me? I hear you and I see your slides. Okay. Mm, sorry, technical difficulties. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Raven Morgan and I work for the Strauss Health Sciences Library. Um, at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. Today I'll be talking about immigration from DSpace to Haiku. I've included our app, my abstract here today just in case anyone wants to review this when the slides are published. Oh, and I already put my slides in our repository. If anyone wants to get them, they're already in there. So we were part of a collective called Mountain Scholar, a collection of libraries across Colorado and Wyoming. We all used the same instance of DSpace and we had our support through CSU. And CSU had hired uh, developers to develop that instance. And then two years ago, CSU announced that they could no longer support our DSpace instance. So we had, we're in kind of a pickle because we were like, okay, what are we gonna do? 
the Strauss Library decided to form a committee to decide what to do. And we went to all the vendor presentations that CSU held, and ultimately CSU decided to go to Content DM. We had some issues with that because it was not open source and it was not able to manage research data, which would mean we would in effect have to have two repositories, which we don't think that we could afford. So instead, we decided to investigate Sandera and Haiku. Um, CU Boulder just implemented their instance of Sandera, which they were able to do because they have in-house developers. We're not able to do that because we don't have any of those in our library. So we wanted something that we could do without having to have developers. We decided to choose Haiku, which is an implementation of Sandera because it's, op it's open source and cloud supported. So then we can have our vendor have all of our data on their servers and then have a backup here on campus without overloading our own servers. Also, Haiku can manage both archival materials and research data. There are currently two vendors for Sandera Haiku, um, Ubiquity Press and Notch 8. Um, they're still only two today. Um, we decided to go with Ubiquity Press. We investigated both vendors. We had demos from both and quotes from both and both have advantages and disadvantages. Honestly, we went with Ubiquity because they gave us a better price quote and some of the committee members felt they were more established. So here's a screenshot of our final website, which <laughs> the haiku person, Kevin, already showed, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny that he showed it already. Um, you can see there that we have our nice little banner. I have more um, screenshots in my presentation because I know not a lot of people have haiku at all. So our migration process was very structured. We had weekly meetings over Zoom during which we discussed who was gonna be doing what that week and what we were gonna be working on. Um, and then we also had an overarching spreadsheet timeline with projected dates for each week. Um, we did not meet all the dates. Some of the weeks got delayed, but we did keep pretty well to that timeline. Um, I created a metadata crosswalk for Ubiquity Press to upload our data. And what I did was I contacted CSU and got a metadata backup from them in our file backup and then delivered those to Ubiquity Press. And then they loaded them into Haiku using the data crosswalk that I had written. Um, during the migration process, you have to build your self-submission form, which means that you have to do that as your foundation for your software. And we kept our website hidden in a demo site until we went live. And we were also able to integrate Google Analytics into Haiku because um, it's part of that options, um, which is really great for us because we already had it through DSpace, so it's very easy just to move our account. It made things a lot easier for us. So we use Dublin Core with CSU, and we wanted to maintain that as strictly as possible. Um, Haiku has way more options than just Dublin Core. So I had to request a lot of custom fields in order to maintain Dublin Core. Specifically, one of the examples is the keywords. Um, Ubiquity Press had only been using keyword fields and I had to request three different subject fields because we're a medical library and I wanted to have mesh as well as LCHS. Um, Ubiquity Press interestingly wanted a lot of clarification about what those fields were and what they meant so that um, they could understand not just what we were doing, but why we were doing it, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and we also did a drop-down selection so each item has a, the DC type standardized. Um, and then we also did a custom date thing where um, some of our dates are numbers and some of them are text because we have 3D images of our artifact collection in our repository and those have a date range, the estimated decade for those artifacts. So we wanted the text field as well as the number field so we can maintain that date range. Um, Haiku has fields outside of Dublin Core, which may be a future if we migrate, which may be an issue if we migrate in the future. But one of the things that our users really wanted was ORCID IDs, so we're still going to keep those custom fields. We didn't end up with multiple migration errors during our migration. Um, the first error that we had was that our university told us that Google Drive was not secure enough to use as a delivery method for our metadata and files, so we had to switch to Google Bucket. Um, we also, Haiku has a very different structure from DSpace. It's much more flattened. So we had to copy and, I copied and pasted all of our image descriptions into an Excel file, which I then added later during our metadata cleanup phase because none of the collection images and descriptions migrated. Um, each collection has to be added as a admin, as the depositor, which I did not know and caused me some delay because I really wish that was part of the step in the 
collection creation process. Like when you created a collection, it automatically added admins, but it's actually a separate step that you have to do for each collection. I'll talk about our handles. Um, none of our ETD dates migrated, so we had to do a huge system update where we added all of our dates to our EDDs, our uh, electronic theses and dissertations. And then um, we lost our publisher field for every single record in our in our metadata because um, Ubiquity Press thought that the publisher and original publisher field were the same, which if you know anything about Dublin Core, they're different. And I had to go back and have them add the publisher field um, separate from the original publisher field. And then we also we increased the file size limits because we have lectures and those are huge um, file sizes if anyone has lecture recordings in their repository. Um, so our biggest issue by far in our, on our migration was our handle DOIs. So when we were in DSpace, we were able to use handles as our permanent URLs for almost all of our items. I mean, we only had a dozen items that had DOIs. Um, so Haiku does not support handles at all. And when I gave Ubiquity Press our data, they stripped off all the handles and said, we can't use any of those. And I was very surprised. <laughs> if I had known this, I would have asked CSU to convert the handles into DOIs because there is a process where you can, can convert them without making a brand new DOI. And I really wish I had known that before migration. So what ended up happening was a very, very extended process where after we migrated, they took off all the handles, then we had to set up a weird redirect main page where the handles would go until we were able to create the DOIs. And when we migrated, um, Ubiquity Press did not have a way to generate batch DOIs, so I specifically waited for them to create that process because it was just not possible for me to make a DOI on each individual item individually. It's just there's too many items. So then there was an unfortunate delay of about three months where we didn't have any permanent URLs for anything in our repository. But it's now mostly fixed now. We have a few items with errors, but it's less than 100, which I consider a victory. So here's some other of the metadata cleanup we ended up doing after our migration, some of it during our migration. Um, obviously, we had to update our DOIs in OCLC and our ILS because none of the old handles would work, and we had to add all the DOIs once they were created. Um, we did um, a custom thing where we need an author type donor because in order to generate a DOI, you need an author on them. And we have artifacts again that don't have an author. So I wanted the donor for the artifacts to be able to generate the DOI. Um, also, we had basic spelling and grammar errors and to update our collection names because the structure was different in Haiku than DSpace. So we ended up um, combining some of our collections. And then um, I had to re add all those logos and descriptions that were not migrated. So uh, Ubiquity Press has an interesting support system. Um, I had never had um, a vendor that had the Slack channel, but I really like using it a lot. If anyone is not familiar, Slack is a communication um, app that you use to contact. And what you do is there's a Slack channel, and then there's also a support ticket system through Jira. And honestly, I found that the easiest way to go about it is to ask them in Slack first, and then they'll create the ticket for me. Um, it's very much helpful to do it that way, I think, than to start the ticket myself. Because a lot of times, I'll just like this week, I was like, this error is happening, but I did not necessarily know the root cause of it. So they went in and figured it out and then created the ticket for the root error. Um, also, the cool thing about their support ticket system is that you can put um, not only bugs and technical support, but enhancement requests into the support ticket system. And what Ubiquity Press will do is that they'll say, um, for this cycle, which is about three to four months, um, tell us which ones are a priority and we'll work on these enhancement requests. And they also ask the other libraries who are on Haiku if they want those enhancement requests. And I've been asked about other libraries requests too. And if they have multiple libraries who want the same enhancement requests, they'll go on and work on it in, on this cycle. So they're really great about listening and adding new things each cycle. So here's a view of the support ticket system. And then these are some of the new features that we ended up adding. Above all, our users wanted ORCID IDs. And again, I did the batch GOI generation from a CSV file. Um, I asked for a unique thing to add unique identifiers to all of our records so that I could go in through the CSV file and update all the metadata without having to touch the files. So it was an interesting thing that I asked them for, and they thought it was really interesting and it works great. Also, we had the mediated deposit that Kevin talked about, which essentially means that when someone self-submits, it doesn't go public, it goes into a 
um, hidden collection for admins to review, and once they review it and approve it, then it's made public. And then I'm going to talk about our shared repository with Auraria. So again, when you set up in Haiku, you have to establish your self-submission form because unfortunately, the self-submission form is the same for admins and for users. So essentially what we did is we prioritized all of the required fields at the top and then hid the admin fields in the bottom half of the page in an expandable section. So you have to deliberately expand it in order to see any of those fields. Thankfully, no one has even opened those fields. I also added help text that said admin only. So I think that that will continue to work pretty well. I do wish that they were separate the admin and the user form. So here's um, the top view of our self-submission form. Um, this is the admin view, because you can see the admin bar. And then um, our user accounts, I had to specifically request that they open to everybody because our repository is the archive for MCMLA and CCML, which are regional organizations. And there was just no way that we could specifically limit to a list because it would be just incomprehensible to even make a list of what email addresses with that many universities potentially submitting to our repository. And then um, lastly, we did our brand new shared search with Auraria because Auraria migrated to Haiku and we were able to build a single search box, a federated search where you can search both of our repositories. And then um, you can see here, we developed this custom um, Denver Skyline background with both of our um, logos there. So this is what Kevin was talking about, like the shared search for both of our libraries. And then here's some enhancement requests we're working on, um, the admin back view and future projects so that people can read my slides. Sorry, I took too much time. Thank you, everybody. Oh, no worries. That was very good. Uh, very uh, complicated migration that you went through. Um, Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> a theme I'm seeing out of all these, I guess that was a, a comment of my own here, uh, from several of the present from the presentations in this uh, theme, and this may be the uh, systems librarian in me coming out, but planning for those uh, exit strategies before you get into, like how you're going to get out of a product before you get into the product. Uh, hard, hard to plan for, but a really important thing to think through because uh, as Jose Javier said, uh, nothing lasts forever. <laughs> going to be moving at some point. Um, Keep a data backup. That's my suggestion. <laughs> Keep a constant data backup. Backups and standards. Using standards that are uh, you can you know semi reliably hope to uh, export and import into new systems. It's, uh, hard to predict, but uh, an important part of it. Uh, 